Gordon and team, thank you so much for leading us in that way. And Gordon, thank you especially for that selection. What a great and appropriate connection to our passage today in 1 Peter chapter 5. I want to encourage you to go ahead and turn there with me to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 11 today, as we are very, very much getting near the end of our series in 1 Peter, Living as Exiles. You may remember this story from last year. In August of 2021, there was a tragic report of a family in the hills of California that died of overheating and dehydration. Um, Beautiful young couple and their baby, toddler age, um, just a very, very sad account. And as the authorities and others, even park rangers, began to really unpack some of the events that led to it, it really was pretty simple. They weren't prepared for what they went into. In fact, when they looked, they certainly found where they had parked and certainly seemed like a pretty innocuous, just pleasing um, event that the, the dad and mom wanted to just go out for a stroll. And literally in their backpack, they had a sippy cup and a two liter bottle of water. But they didn't have mapping. They had no GPS kind of phone. They didn't understand and know that there would be no connection to cellular services. They had not let anyone know where they were going so that when they came up missing that anyone even knew where to look. Of course, many people would go there and they would camp, but they would be well prepared. And while this is certainly no inappropriate uh, kind of doubling down or, or in a sense dogpiling on the dead, I don't mean it that way whatsoever, but there have been several articles that have come out since Um, through outdoor magazines and different things, using that anecdotally as, as evidence of be ready for what you're heading into. Understand the conditions. It got up to 109 that day. And that certainly probably didn't even consider the surface temperature. Now, in the course of it, the park rangers have, have given lists of different things to make sure you have with you. Things like Maps. Make sure that you're not dependent on maps electronically or digitally because you may not have active service. Make sure in advance you tell a friend or a neighbor where you're heading, especially if you're heading to the outdoors, but also to understand that you may want to let park rangers know or even leave a note on your car before you head out. Check the weather. Make sure. Don't assume that you can just kind of make it or press through or push through this. Very, very, very tragic end. Now, that's an extreme extreme illustration. Many of us have not as extreme illustrations, but we've tasted this just enough to know that we, many of us, if not all of us at some point, have had a bit of arrogance heading out up against nature. Dads do it all the time, thinking that somehow um, with their amazing amounts of fortitude and expeditiousness that they can mow the yard in 20 minutes before they need to be at a meeting. You've seen this occur. I myself have endangered my own son on one of his birthdays when we were still in Texas. We went to a place called Enchanted Rock, which is the second largest single rock formation in our country. And um, the, well, we were close to the car, but let me tell you that I didn't realize that the surface temperature of the rock that day would be over 120. And um, yeah, so it was, uh, and it was July in Texas. There was just a whole lot that, that really exposed um, my son's arrogance in thinking that we could do this. It was totally on me. Um, I, I will tell you that normally on these events, I would share a lot of pictures. I think I took one and when I took it and sent it, I realized that I should not send any more because he was very flushed. And um, so fortunately, we stopped and we went back as quickly as we could. And, um, but I think my son, as long as he remembers that time, will remember it's the time he's been nearest to death. Um, so let's just say that there might have been a few extra Legos purchased when we went to the Lego store following that event. But I don't mean to go from despair and sincerity and tragedy to comedy as if we are going through the gamut of Greek plays. But the fact is, it is interesting. When you look at pride, we often will find any number of, you know, videos, and they'll title it karma or fail videos. And in, in, in general, you will see that in light of people's hubris, 
that incredible amounts of error occur to them in response. But there's also a reason that some of the Greek tragedies have persevered because so many of them have related to the prideful actions of leaders and the tragic downfall to basically support what we know to be the truth and tenet of Scripture, which is pride cometh before a fall. Now, even though this message is not solely about pride and humility, I need you to understand that because of the nature of the text and when Peter says to clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility, there is in a very real sense nothing that is mentioned in this text that is apart from humility. Either what we're to understand about it or even the actions that we are to take to make sure that we are guarding ourselves against pride, but also to understand that it is there is a veracity, there is a, a, a vivaciousness that occurs to the Christian witness when we humbly approach the things of God, God himself, the things that he has made, and even actually one another, humility. It is easy to identify pride, but the fact is a humble believer sticks out in the crowd in all the right ways. Let's read our text. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now flip back to the beginning of this book, of this letter to these churches in Asia Minor. Go back to chapter 1 and look at starting in verse 3. In some ways, Peter is revisiting many of the themes that he's already written about in his letter. And again, remembering this is the first of two letters towards the end of his life, and he is not far from his own martyrdom. In verse 3 of chapter 1, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, at the beginning of the letter, he reminds them that there is an eternal hope and eternal glory that is being established for them and preserved for them, and they are being built for it. And to keep in, that in mind, though, for now, you may experience suffering. If you look at the end, what we just read, he actually is then in almost inverse order at this summary saying, there is suffering. You need to understand that that suffering is difficult, and there are great cares, and there are great things that are going to come against you in this world. But... Keep your eyes on the fact that Jesus Christ will reveal himself one day and he will deliver you from this, but it ends the same to the praise and the glory of God the Father, God the Son, through the powerful working of the Holy Spirit. So again, these themes are, are recurring, even though they may be presented in a different order of experience, so to speak, or in articulation. The fact is, we need to remember these things. In fact, if you were to read, we'll, we'll eventually get to 2 Peter. Um, I think we'll start that in the fall is the plan at this point. But you will see that Peter at the end of his life has this theme, this kind of active disciple-making theme as an apostle. And that is reminder. He regularly says, I want to stir you up by way of reminder. 
Friends, we need to be reminded of there being an eternal glory. We need to be reminded that there is going to be suffering and trial and difficulty in this world. We also need to understand and remember what Peter has said in his letter, which is, if we are to suffer, let it be because we are believers and because we are going about our lives in such a way that is believing, meaning that we are sharing the gospel, but we're also sharing it in such a way that is consistent with Christ. Now, nonetheless, that doesn't necessarily touch on things like cancer or COVID or other things like that. Certainly, again, as we've tried to say pretty regularly, even though it doesn't necessarily specifically deal with that type of suffering, I think the principles still apply. Because many of us in the West, we just aren't going through the kind of persecution that in, in, face, uh, in the face of actually living out our faith that we are facing up against opposition. But some of you do. Some of you do live with an unbelieving spouse and you face this on a regular basis. And you live with the guilt of knowing that you've responded in an unchristlike way. And it's hard to apologize to someone who has no concept of what mercy or grace or forgiveness really means. And yet, you know, as a Christian, you need to submit yourself and, and apologize and ask forgiveness for your sinfulness and set the course again. But it may not ease your difficulty. Or you may be in a workplace where in the workplace you are living as a believer. And because of maybe it's a supposed thing, but it could be an actual realized thing that because of your faithfulness to Christ... And your Christ-like honoring demeanor and even your speech in the right and appropriate ways and, and times. That you suffer there because of the sneering of others. Of either co-workers or even people that are over you. So it does still happen. But the fact is, as we look at this text and as we get to the end of this letter. It is very important that we understand two simple things. I've simply entitled the message in living exiles. These are notes for the journey that we are to walk in humility, but we're also to walk towards victory. Now, I don't want this to, I even, I I was even uncomfortable with my own headings for these two points because it sounded a little too, um, I don't know. It, It just, I don't say cheesy, but it was really close, but I I still think this is the appropriate thing. I want us to consider walking in humility. What does that look like as exiles in this world? But also understanding that we walk towards victory. We have to remember this as well. Otherwise, what happens? We will get out of perspective. It will become askew how we view this world. We are geared to be citizens of a kingdom. We are geared to worship something, someone, to have a king. And in that, if we are not leaning towards and walking towards what we know to be eventual victory for those that are in Christ Jesus, I promise you that you will try to make then heaven on earth. And you will try to buffer your suffering in sinful ways, even if it's not sin itself. So let's say you're not anesthetizing your difficulty by being on illicit illegal drugs or addicted to painkillers or something like that. It could simply be a good thing or it could be just simply a a regular thing, but you're using it to displace the fact that you should be casting your cares upon the Lord and that you should remember that it's not about just the aversion of pain. It's about understanding that there's purpose in that pain. Let's talk first about walking in humility, verses 5 through 7. So as we went through verses 1 through 4, just prior to Easter, we were talking about shepherds. We were talking about elders, essentially, who are to lead suffering sheep. How does that happen? In their midst, among them, it needs to be with them. It has to be present. It has to be exemplary. There has, we have to make sure we're pressing into faithful teaching and we're doing it not out of compulsion or out of some kind of illicit gain or some kind of selfish gain, but we're doing it because there is love and calling. Even then, we don't want to do it simply out of duty, but there may be times that it feels dutiful, but that doesn't need to be the course of the trajectory for elders who would lead you in your midst. And our church has elders. I would argue that every true church has elders by some name or another, whether it's just called pastors or whatever, um, because every true church has two offices, elders and deacons. 
Now I think you can interchange elders and pastors. And so most of our churches that we have all been a part of at some point have had these two distinct roles. But in response to that in verse 5, he says that likewise, you who are younger, and it doesn't necessarily mean those who are literally by age younger, but it's definitely just simply a separate group. And he says, you are to submit to the elders. It's a pretty simple thing that he says. But it's just a very simple sentence. The idea is it provides and makes for a very mutually happy church when elders humbly and sacrificially lead and lead by example out of love, out of calling. And when the body then submits, and that doesn't mean, again, subjugation or just being told what to do. It means that there is a deferment to trust. It doesn't mean blind trust, but it does mean that you pray for these people that are walking among you and desiring your best and wanting, wanting you to be built up, that you're praying for them, that you are supporting them and building them up. And that you do support them, that basically you don't take someone else's word for it, that you actually go and want to hear it directly from them if there's been anything. There's a reason that scripture says if you ever hear a charge against an elder, go confirm it with him and take someone with you to confirm it. Don't then sit there and stir things off to the side. That doesn't make for a happy church. In fact, that's very much what Satan wants to do in suffering is to bring division. But very quickly, Peter turns and goes really to the entire congregation, all, everyone, elders, congregant, whoever. And he says, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. But then he turns it from the horizontal to the vertical. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Now, our problem in the West is that we hear may exalt you, and we think that somehow this is up on the pedestal receiving a medal or some kind of win. That's not at all what this means. I think it would be much more appropriate to think that this exaltation actually has to do with being taken home into his presence (laughs) a whole lot more than just simply winning. We have no guarantee that we're going to win in this world. But we absolutely know that the Lord is the lifter of our heads. We do know that the Lord does edify and build up his body. He strengthens them. He causes them to get off of their faces and knees to stand firm in their faith to look to him. They are literally lifted up off the ground. It is just one more indicator of those opposites that we see throughout Scripture. If you want to be first, be last. For those who want to be lifted up, you must humble yourself. Now, this isn't a, we just had, there was a cleanup day this weekend in the city. And hopefully in the future, that's something that will even form groups and participate as a church just to be out there with, uh, with the community. But in the midst of that, I want you to understand, even though that's a great thing to do, humility is not just going around picking up trash and putting it in trash, can, trash bags. Okay, which by the way, when you're driving on a one, please don't hit the trash bag that would kind of negate uh, what they've done. Uh, over this week, if you're wondering why there's so many white trash bags on the road. That's not necessarily humility, nor is humility simply self-deprecation that you just think badly about yourself. You just have the Eeyore complex and just woe is you. That's not necessarily humility either. In fact, you very much can have that perspective and be filled with pride. To walk in humility means this. When he says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. There's some indicator there in him just saying mighty hand. So that at the proper time he may exalt you. And he says this, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. What I see in this is as we are humbling, humble, humbling ourselves before one another, and we are having mutual humility in the horizontal, it has to be done in light of what's going on vertically. So I want you to see this as a big picture. This isn't necessarily check boxes or tick boxes that we go, okay, that's done, that's done. Okay, now I'm humble. We're whole people. This is a holistic picture. It's more like, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen, um, I, I like to watch some of these YouTube videos of people that are incredible artists, especially sometimes you'll find sidewalk artists and they will literally start with something that you don't understand what's going on. And especially the ones that are able to do it upside down and, and you're going, I don't even understand. And they're almost to the end. I still don't get it. And then they turn it around and you're like, wow. This isn't about having an aha moment as much as understanding and being patient that this is about different brush strokes and all the different factors coming in to paint the picture of what does it look like to be a Christian who is humble, 
to other people, humble before the Lord, but at the same time living and walking towards victory. What does that even look like? Well, I say, first of all, that we are trusting God with our circumstances. This is part of humility. In fact, this, even, even the phrase, cast your, your cares, it's, it's a little bit troubling because it's actually a passive imperative. And what that means is basically there's nothing you can do about it or there's really no action to take, but you have to consider. So basically consider yourself this or whatever. There's a, there's a command to consider yourself something like consider yourself dead to sin. That would be a passive command, but there are active commands that go with that, right? So if you're going to consider yourself dead to sin, what do you have to do? Resist temptation. That's an active imperative. So here you have this passive idea, but you're still commanded to do it, which is cast your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. That we are trusting in God's character and nature, and we trust that he has the cares. He's got us in this. But this is so far from let go and let God kind of theology. Because that theology, that idea tends to do this. Let go, let God, basically just kind of ignore it. Just kind of let God deal with it and you go on about your business. I think you'll see in our passage that's not biblical. Cast your cares. That means that you trust that God has allowed or caused the difficult circumstances you are in. I know that's hard to take. I know that depending on how hard those circumstances are, that is the slippery slope of people deconstructing their faith because they can't understand how can God be so good and allow such a thing. But especially in this context, if the outside world is pressing in against the church because of her faithful witness, we trust that God, because Peter said multiple times, if it be the Lord's will, if it be the Lord's will, They go through this measure of suffering. They have to trust. And yes, there's some mental assent to it, passive mental assent that I consider that God is in control of this. I'm going to give him this, but I think you're going to see the active way that that is supported. But I think this mentality is all about what it means to be humble before the Lord. We trust that God has allowed these difficult circumstances. But again, Peter would be clear. If you are suffering, basically if you're in jail because you broke the law, I mean, sure, you can say, well, that is, you know, the Lord allowed that and willed that. He didn't, he didn't necessarily cause you to, to sin, but he set up a, a legal system to, you know, cause you to not hurt, maim, kill other people because of your reckless behavior. So in that sense, you could thank God for just getting your attention. Yes, absolutely. But what we're saying is a little bit different here. When we have suffered in a sense righteously, we think that doing righteousness actually leads then to some kind of blessing, but we're suffering and that confuses us. We need to trust that if we're doing the things according to God's will, then we can trust that whatever suffering comes, God is in it. That's the passive casting your cares on him. You trust that God is in the circumstances. Along the way, you are. Yes, I think there is that submission to godly leaders because leaders are to help you. We're to submit to one another. I think there's even that sharing, learning how to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. This idea of humility basically means that our, ca- our casting of our cares and this idea of casting is, is actually fantastic. I love the word picture. It's either to propel or transfer. I'm focusing on transfer because in addition to an uptick in COVID, there have been a couple of people with stomach viruses that have been around me and the propel word just doesn't fly with me right now. So I'm focusing on transfer. I don't want to think about propulsion. So on the transfer side of things, I'm literally taking from one place and establishing it on another. And this interaction that happens horizontally as well as vertically in my cares, I'm sharing my cares with elders, those who are sick, what do you do? Go to your elders and have them pray over you. Confess your sins one to another that you might be healed. It takes humility for us to share our concerns and our hurts. Look, if we are suffering because of righteous activity and righteous behavior and righteous living, that doesn't mean it's not going to hurt. 
Do you think Satan lets up just because you get it, that you have understood, oh, I'm suffering because of righteousness, not, not, not in a haughty way, but just simply you, the Lord has made clear to you according to the scripture that, look, I really am, I know I'm doing the right thing, but I'm really taking the hits for it. Just that mental ascent, do you think that means that Satan all of a sudden is going to stop? No, what is he going to focus on? This thing really, really hurts. So he's going to take that pain He's going to put his thumb on it and he's going to do everything he can to distract you from the purpose and the reason. And you know what you'll do? Oftentimes we will run then to something to anesthetize the pain. It doesn't matter what we've assented. This is God's will. God has done this. God's allowed this, but it still hurts. If you don't then learn how to dispel and dispense of that pain with others around you to the Lord ultimately, there's a lion. And he's prowling and he's looking for anyone to devour. So walking in humility means that we are trusting God with the circumstances. We are submitting to godly leaders. We're submitting to one another. But we do have to ask ourselves as we cast our cares, how do we, in a sense, manage the cares that come as a result of suffering? How do we manage this pain? Or you could even put it, how do we manage, in a sense, this anxiety that occurs because we are in such suffering? How do we do that? Well, to cast, again, is to transfer. We do that to the Lord through prayer. We do that with others through confession, asking others to pray for us, to let them join in on our hurt. That's a difficult thing. That was a hard thing for Jan and I. And again, this isn't related to suffering uh, because of, of living righteously but it was a measure of suffering that still exemplifies this, this um, point and principle. In one of our churches, we were in a very difficult situation. There was a, a good number of the people that were not just like academically liberal. We had some people when we went there that were teaching in the classrooms, Sunday school classrooms, that the, uh, the miracles were all allegorical. And that the five loaves and fishes, that wasn't actually a literal miracle. And of course, my press to them when I got there was, where is this going? Because eventually this has to go either to incarnation or resurrection. Where are you going with this? So, I, but at the same time, there, weren't, there wasn't a lot of confrontation right off the bat because I'm just preaching through the gospel of John. But I am from a perspective of it being literal. Even though John gives us a lot of interpretation. Well, in the course of this, Jan and I, we had Anna and Elizabeth at the time, and, and Tucker, we had a dog, and um, yeah, happy little family of four, but then the Lord allowed us to go through some miscarriage, probably a couple of them. The first one was really difficult, and we had never experienced something like that before, and so uh, just learning how to navigate that as, as a young couple, and also in such a public kind of uh, setting, your inclination the next time you get pregnant is a lot of trepidation, right? You're, you're just, you're not sure you want to let anybody know. And the Lord just really worked through a lot of factors to remind me and Jan that we have to share our joys and our pains with the body. And so we did. We, we started to celebrate that we were pregnant again, but then we shared also sadness because once you say that, but again, I mean, we're not, we're, we're, this is different than sports because sports it is. I mean, if you say something and they lose, you don't ever say that again. Well, that's, that's just truth. I'm just kidding. But we don't believe in that kind of superstition that, oh, if I say that we're pregnant, then, then maybe it'll happen that we won't, you know, something bad will happen. That's not what this is about. What we're really doing is managing our pain, right? It's kind of a preemptive strike. What we didn't realize later on was the Lord was using that pain to keep the mouth shut of people who were against the preaching of the gospel. People who wanted to literally endorse every lifestyle on the planet as being that kind of, that's what we do in Christian love. And because they were enough old school, it was, it was in the South, and they were enough old school church that they knew you didn't say anything bad about the preacher when his wife was going through a lot of suffering. Because that, that's a really bad look. So you know what happened? For about a year, I preached. They didn't like it, but they couldn't say anything, and they left. And almost within just a couple of weeks, we, saw, we literally saw about 30 or 40 people leave because of their liberal views, and did. They went to a church that was uh, 
gay affirming and even in the leadership. But we saw so many people come, literally within weeks, we saw 30 or 40 new people come and join the church and stay with the church even after we left. It was just a beautiful thing to watch. The Lord uses that pain for purposes that you may not know in the moment, but you trust. And we have to share that and dispel of that because I didn't know everything was going on. I just knew that there was just this little principle of needing to share this because it was a great care and it was a great concern. And as much as we might want privacy, and this doesn't mean you have to step outside of your personality with every little hurt that you have or or fear being a whiner. Um, I mean, don't be a whiner, but at the same time, just I I understand the, the hesitations. We are, a lot of us are very different. Nonetheless, we are to cast our cares. We have to get them away from us because if we are the other type, which is more of a caretaker of our cares, there ends up being pride in that because we think we can handle it on our own. In fact, oftentimes these are people who have struggled with increased prayerlessness. It's incredible how our lack of humility with each other in sharing our difficulty and pain, because oftentimes, how is that shared? Brother, would you pray for me? Sister, would you pray for me? When we are caretakers of our own cares, we just keep it to ourselves or hide it under our our mattresses, hoping it'll just kind of go away. We'll say we just don't want to bother anyone with it. It's pride. It's pride because that pain will eat you up. Satan will take it because you know what he does? He isolates you with it. He'll either convince you that you're the only one that has ever hurt like this or that you'll just be bothering someone else with it and they really wouldn't be that concerned anyway. Okay, even though we're not there yet, in light of that, in light of Satan's tactics, do you see what they say in just a little bit? He says that, remember this, that you're going through the same kinds of suffering that are being experienced by the brotherhood throughout the world. You're not alone. So you see, these are practical effects of how to walk in humility. We have to cast, propel, transfer our cares to the Lord, oftentimes via other people. So think about it. Think about the destination of your casting or as you cast your cares, where does it go? Are you hiding it and keeping it to yourself, thinking it would bother others? Please consider the insidious pride that that lingers behind that decision. Is it, again, just to kind of hide it under the mattress, hoping it'll just go away? Again, there's pride there thinking that without the Lord's help, without something that the pain will just somehow magically dispel. And You're also saying that if it doesn't dispel, you can handle it. God opposes the proud. In fact, even in this is an indicator of one of the purposes of suffering that he allows. To humble us. To remind us that he is God and we ain't. Don't we need that reminder of his transcendence pretty regularly? I mean, we don't need to go so far as to treat him as he's impersonal, but we also have to remember, whether it's a theological issue that we have or we're struggling otherwise, his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. The second that you think, whether theologically or through some doctrine that you're struggling with, that you are implementing onto God your sense, humanly, of justice, even though he is infinite, you're finite. You go A to B, injustice leads to this, Or this act leads to that. And God sees it all. Oftentimes when he allows us to suffer, we're scratching our heads as to why. And we simply have to humbly say, you are in the circumstances. I trust you. And so I give you my cares, Lord. And I'm going to do that by, in faith, which I don't see you. But I'm going to do that with things also in people that I do see by giving it also to them. I'm going to ask for prayer. I'm going to ask for help. I'm going to reach out and thrust this upon others in the appropriate kind of way of bringing them in to share because we are one body. But even though that is passive, the casting of cares, let's talk about the active part, which is walking towards victory. See, again, I think this is going to underscore this is not the let go, let God theology of just casting your cares. I mean, well, just, just cast your cares. 
I'll never forget in college, you know, used to hear people do Bible studies all the time on just trusting the Lord. And I would ask, what does that mean? And it was like one of those definitions that they just almost couldn't use the word, couldn't, couldn't not use the word trust in the definition. Well, what does it mean to trust? Well, it just means, I mean, it means you, you know, you trust him. What does that look like? Now, I didn't know anything about passive and active at the time, but it's really helped me since to understand the nature of it because every time we see a passive command of trust the Lord with all your heart or to have faith, there is somewhere in the context active imperatives of how to go about it, decisions that have to be made. Let's put it this way. Your circumstances often are truly completely out of your control. At least if there is suffering or, you know, from the outside because of you living a godly way, which is more of the context here, or if you're just going through physical ailment and suffering, that is again, in a sense, no fault of your own. We're in a fallen world, sinful effects everywhere, every molecule. So there's cancers. So you can cast that care of illness upon the Lord and say, God, this is yours. But how do you do that actively? Well, as a parent, oftentimes we will say things like, guys, you can't control your circumstances, but you can control what? Your response in the circumstances. How you react. That's where the Spirit of God has to infuse our decision-making for us to do the things actively that will support the passive resolution that we've determined, God, you care for me, so I give this to you. And I think that's where this leans into verses 8 through 11, walking towards victory. He says, be sober-minded. Look in verse 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now we have active commands. So to walk towards victory in light of clothing yourselves with humility, so that means this goes with you, you're clothed in it as you're walking. It's your traveling clothes. So take note, prepare well, pack well. Your clothing is humility as you're walking. You're walking towards victory. In order to maintain the humility, you have to be sober-minded. This is the cadence. You have to think in terms of, I do accept God's sovereign hand in my circumstances, but I've got to be circumspect in what I see going on around me. I need to see it from the standpoint of God's in control, but I also have to see it understanding that there is someone prowling. There is, he's just saying, awaken. He's not just saying, be aware, but he also says with watchful, beware. Don't just be aware of what's going on around you. So again, you can't just say, God, here's your cares. This is why you can't just pack it away under the mattress. And then just go on or let go and let God. And then just go on about your day, go on about your week, your month, your year, acting like everything will be magically fine without anybody addressing anything about it. We have to understand that he has called us to be aware, sober-minded, but also beware, be watchful. Because there is an enemy, there is a devil. He prowls, he's looking to devour, even without the specifics. Does lion, prowling, devouring sound like a good prospect? You don't have to know all the specifics of just exactly how this enemy will do it. But you know what? I think we get a few hints at some of the tactics that the enemy uses in the way that Peter tells them to be careful. Look at what he says. So he says, resist this enemy. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour Okay, so resist him, firm in your faith. So first of all, you need to know truth. Too often, we will spend so much of our time, and I think we've certainly seen this through political cycles over the last several years. We are much more interested in what to hate about the people we're against rather than being joyfully exuberant about the positions that we hold. 
And Christians have done this for a long time. They often will address things that they're against, a particular doctrine or whatever, instead of happily share in and worship in light of the truths that we all share in unity. Be firm in the faith because what happens? Satan will take truth and twist it. You know what 2 Peter's about? 2 Peter's about the unity of the faith in light of the fact that false teaching has come in because of suffering on the outside. He said, cast your cares, but he follows it up with another letter that says, stand firm in the gospel because now there are false teachers in your midst. You know what those false teachers taught in 2 Peter? They taught that, look, basically undermining the teaching of the apostles, if you really were following him like you were supposed to, you wouldn't be suffering like this. And what did Peter, what was Peter telling them? If you do suffer, make sure it's for the gospel's sake. And if so, trust that it's God's will in it and then humble yourselves with other people and before God. But if you don't, if you don't cast those cares and that pain as a result of the suffering, what happens? What happens is why Peter wrote 2 Peter. I think they justly, not justly suffered as far as they deserved it. I think they were righteous in how they were living for the most part. But then they didn't manage the pain and the cares as a result of that suffering all that well. And it allowed in false teachers that would create the pillow or the buffer in this world. They started to believe it. Stand firm in your faith. A way to resist the enemy is to know what you believe. Remind yourself of truth. One way you do this in the midst of pain is make sure that you have a regular cadence of what we call the common means of grace. Word, prayer, worship with the saints. Be in the word, be in prayer privately, but also corporately. Be with the saints. Don't give up doing that. Why? Because of the next thing, Satan loves to isolate. As great as lions are, you know what? They still look for the weakest one in the pack. They still look for the one lagging behind or the one that might be caught up in a thicket. He says, understand, stand firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Why would he say this? Because he knows that one thing Satan does is make you feel like you're the only one that's going through what you're going through. And if he can get you to feel isolated, he'll get you alone. And do you think, you think he's going to be content with you just kind of weeping off in the corner, curled up in fetal position? Absolutely not. He sees that as a well done steak. And he will not stop until you have been destroyed. And this is why you can't allow sin to come in. A lot of times we go back to pet sins because we're suffering and we almost feel like we deserve a break from the hurt. So we go back to sins that we're familiar with, that are comfortable to us. We don't really have time, but I would encourage you to look at James chapter 1. Because James chapter 1 has a curious transition. You know chapter 1, it's all about count it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter trials of various types and kinds. And he goes on and say, if you're lacking wisdom, then pray. He goes on and on. But then in verse 12 and 13, there's a transition. He says, don't any of you say or blame God and say that you tempted me to sin. It was kind of a shocking, jarring transition. It's, it's almost like, you know, an apostolic squirrel. Don't suffer. Understand that if you do suffer, it's a good trial. Sin! You know, squirrel. Actually, no, though, because he goes on, what do we do? If we don't handle the pain and the difficulty well, the temptation is to sin. But it's a strategic sin. It's to alleviate hurt. Satan will isolate you and make you feel like you're the only one. So he says, in order to resist the evil one, in order to walk in actively in humility, we have to be sober-minded. We have to be aware of our surroundings. We have to also have to be aware and beware that there is an enemy who is prowling. He is after us. And one of the ways that he does that is he will cause us to believe false things because we're just hurting that much. We have to stand in truth. He will also try to get us off to the side, isolate us, make us feel like we're the only ones. And if we're sharing our hurt with others, so often the great comfort is, I know exactly what you're going through. But you know what, guys, even if you don't know what a person's going through and they share with you their hurt, you can probably empathize just enough to figure out that that must be incredibly hurtful. I will pray for you. Don't dismiss that. 
If you share that, you're pushing away and resisting the evil one from isolating you in your pain. And again, in private, in the dark corners, what happens? Do you think we sin only when everything's going great and we just decide, I'm going to go hide off in a dark place? No. Satan will allow, will put us in a position to hurt and hurt and hurt. And if we don't trust and humble ourselves before the Lord and before other people, we will hold on to that pain and we will isolate and we'll back off. And before we know it, we're in a corner and it's dark and we realize that we think no one's watching and we will then sin because it has distracted us from what has put us in that corner. These are part of his tactics. Resist him. Resist him. And lastly, just fix your gaze. Be aware, beware, resist the enemy, and fix your gaze. He says, and after you have suffered a little while, verse 10, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, establish you. Everything that suffering has undermined in your life, instability, hurt, pain, injury, that will all be rectified, but perfectly, purely. Fix your gaze, but where are you fixing your gaze? It's not a place. It's a person. Now, I understand if you think of of heaven or, or, you know, if, if that's just attached nicely for you, great. But I encourage you with the discipline mentally, emotionally, even spiritually to think, I'm looking forward to Christ. Because you know the description, right? There's no sun. Why? Christ illumines. He is all in all. The only reason heaven is heaven is because Christ is there. Fix your gaze on a person. He is preparing that place for you. He is preparing you for that place. And he is going to get you there. You can trust and believe it and bank on it. But you've got to remember it because there is going to be some pain along the way. That's why I love this simple little doxology at the end. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. First of all, it's probably the shortest doxology we have in the New Testament. And you actually don't have the word dominion used all that often. I think it gives a great example of any time that we think of God's sovereign control, his domination, it's meant to be a comfort. Not something we use to to dismiss how people feel. We'll just get over it. It's just God's will. Or depending on what you believe about uh, sharing Christ with other people, None of us are God, so none of us knows God's will or God's plan or working in other people's lives. So we're supposed to tell the gospel to all flesh, right? But when you're a believer, his sovereignty becomes a great comfort. Why? Because if we could jump out of his hand, we would. But he has dominion. He's not going to let anyone snatch his sheep away. And he's not even going to allow any decisions that we make to cause us to leap out of his hand. His dominion and sovereignty is a comfort. Remember that as you go through your pain. So as we close, simply, I just want to encourage you, if you do suffer, suffer as a believer. And if God does allow that suffering, remember to humble yourself before others because it's going to still hurt, even if you understand that there's a bigger purpose in it. And share that hurt with other people. Ask them to pray for you. Submit it to the Lord in this, but also understand that that humility requires some activity. And that activity is you have to be aware of your circumstances. You have to be aware that there is also an enemy that is out to get you and he will try to isolate you and he will try to get you to believe things that you never thought you possibly could believe. But I promise you, if you hurt enough, remember the people in that church I told you about that believe so much liberal beliefs? The two main instigators had both experienced deep, deep, deep loss in their lives the loss of a child that they couldn't rectify and a horrible, horrible divorce that the person couldn't wrap his mind around who was a former pastor. That deep pain led to isolation, which led to believing differently.
Friend, if you don't know Christ or you're not sure if you do, is it possible that your struggles, a lot of times people who don't know Christ, they come to church because, or they watch online because they are hurting just enough. They're looking for answers. I know you may be looking for the relief or the dismissal of all pain, but that's not Jesus. He will give purpose and meaning to it. And yes, hopefully because of the Spirit, when He comes inside of you, a lot of that pain will go away because it it will no longer be because of rampant sin just ruling in your life. But friend, is it possible that you are here today or watching because God wants you to cast the greatest care that all of us have ever had? that he actually has already had cast upon him on the cross, your sin. Because ultimately, if you try to bear that care on your own, that pride does indeed lead to actual hell, not a living one as far as in this world. Do you believe that Jesus bore that greatest care, sin, on your behalf? There's nothing else you can bring to the table to try to alleviate that care. Only what Jesus did on the cross can do that. And because he's alive, because he's been risen from the dead, you get to walk in victory because he's preparing a place for you. Because once you trust that the sin has been relieved, you know that you have a home. And he will get you there. And there will be some pain along the way. And for maybe a few, a whole lot. But for the believer, that pain, as we've said before, is a megaphone. And you get to share mercy and grace to a world that doesn't get. How in the world can you respond to your pain like that? And you get to tell them about your hope. Church, let's pray. God, we thank you for your mercy to us and your kindness, your grace. God, we do pray that you would help us to know Help us to live this standard of humbling ourselves before each other, before you. To trust the work that you're doing, but Lord, also to be active in this, to know that we do need to be aware that there is an enemy who wants to isolate us, who wants to help us and cause us to believe falsely. And all of that is for the purpose of nothing short of destruction. But we have a Christ who is living. We have a Christ who has conquered every false belief. We have a Christ that has conquered every care, has experienced every bit of the pain and temptation we ever would, but without sin and without being isolated. But he casts all of that upon you, most notably in the garden. He knew the purpose. He still asked for relief of the pain. He casts it upon you so that we have both the example, but also the need in our own salvation to know that it did not lead him even in that moment to sin. But he bore the weight of our sin. And then because he rose from the dead, there really is no other place for our cares to go. So Lord, help the believer to cast their cares afresh. Help the believer to humble themselves afresh by sharing their hurt and their pain with others. And to be on the watch of Satan isolating them causing them to believe the lies that they're alone. And God, for the person who's here because of hurt, but not because they know you, help them to be awakened even now to see that it is sin that is their care. It is their sin that they can, in a sense, cast upon you, that has already been put upon you, that you've already bore, that they would believe it for themselves and be relieved of that care knowing there will still be pain, knowing there will still be hurt, but they then will have the hope of eternal life to look forward to, to share with the world about, and they will find purpose in all of that pain. We pray this for your glory and your name's sake. Let it be done in us. Amen. As the worship team comes, guys, if you'd like to visit with anyone about what it means to come to Christ, or if you have cares that you'd like to share with elders or leaders or have someone pray for you, some of our guys will be in the back, along the back walls, even out in the foyer. Please go and share. Cast those things upon them. Let them share that load as you then are casting it upon the Lord and see if he doesn't begin to relieve some of your pain so that you are able to say, blessed, praise be, he has dominion forever and ever. Amen.